Now, no ordinary train was good enough for the boys of the Philco Brigade on their annual Sunday school treat. They had to have a sort of super hedge special, taken from stock and fitted with shock absorbers. Well, it needed shock absorbers when Norman Bauer appeared in a boater. This was indeed the last straw. Captain Parry, the gay Gambier, accompanied by Swaff, inspected the engine. But that didn't make the slightest difference, and punctually ten minutes late, away she steamed, bound for Tilbury, with the greatest cargo of beer shifters and bird fanciers ever carried on a single train. Well, before you could say wattle for the sixteenth time, there was Tilbury and the good ship Yakahiki Pura. After considerable arguments to how many funnels she had, the noble 700 were coaxed on board. Well, it was no easy task to store away such a cargo, but they were soon battened down except these old salts who invaded the bridge, just to tell the captain how to box the compass. In this picture you will see Barnacle Bill, Davy Jones, Captain Kettle and Second Officer Teapot, and Charlie Johnson, the famous pilot, who has pushed many a schooner across the bar in his time, directed the skipper in the way he should go and was promptly ordered below. Note Tim Williams and the Black Ferry. He'll shortly be chaining it for a raspberry. Aha, Charlie Fitton and Frank Grindrod, two old sea dogs. The two eastern gentlemen, christened the Singh brothers by the inventive publicity Paul, looked after the luggage, some of which was leaking. That accounts for the black looks they're giving the tourists. Later on, as we will see, they became more friendly when they found that the Philco fraternity were comparatively civilised. On deck, the Baker brothers, along with Groves of Bristol, proceeded to get their sea legs. Later on, it was proved that the legs were hollow. There is Charlie Johnson again. He seems to be in every picture taken on the cruise. And so at last, the ram Pura left Tilbury, much to Tilbury's relief, and set out on a perilous voyage across uncharted seas. Deck games were soon in full swing. Not the sort of deck games usually played on a cruise. This was a stag party. But great skill was shown. Great skill. Oh, quite, quite. Aha, here we seem to see our friend Brian Rennell, crown and anchor expert. Creditors are still looking for him. Yes, deck tennis raged incessantly as long as the light lasted. Of course, the decks were lit up at night, and so was everybody else on board. Still, it was great fun. Ah, who's that? That's right, that's Hall of Stevenage, scratching his leg. I think he's been hobnobbing with the Singh brothers. Now here we have Carlton Dyer. He's playing dummy to Fogarty, the famous ventriloquist from the Emerald Isle. And he was the life and soul of the party. Also with him is Mr. Green, without Green Carnation, as audience. As a singer, he's a good dummy. At least reception wasn't too good on this or any other occasion. He's singing the captain's theme song. If you want a leadership, use leadership. Another good act was aided and abetted by Alan Knight, and also prominent was a berry which should have been bedded. Oh, boys, what fun we had. And little Audrey laughed and laughed and laughed. Well, the boat drill wasn't too popular, because no one wanted to take to the water, especially the sisters Delco Remy. The sudden call to don life belts was caused, apparently, by a list of starboard, owing to Reg Carter and Chadwick being on the same side at the same time. When Reg went to port and Chad went to Guinness, all was swell. All right, we can see you all right. Now here are the Singh brothers at close quarters, for by this time the twins have become triplets, and as like as three Singhs. You are now witnessing the Indian rope trick for the first time. Now oh, there's the other black pudding in the boat. Let me introduce uh, Messrs. Sisson, Lane and Swaff, known on the stage as Fair, Wear and Tear. They're doing a little melodrama on the high seas. The idea is one goes over the side, and the other two have to guess who it is. A bit potty, but it was good fun. Aha, here's Charlie Johnson getting his eye in for Copenhagen. Yes, he's an expert, but what a curious place for Swaff to wear a life belt. He evidently prefers to float bottom upwards. Good work, Charlie. Now, these two uh, boys, Clark and Hogden, have evidently gone cruising before. They know the right technique. Ah, well, boys will be girls. 
Ah, the swindle sheet expert, Frank Rutley, also knows something about figures. You should have seen him in Hornbeck. But that's a closed ledger now. Twice one or two, we know that, yes. Bombardier, I mean, uh, Gambardier Parry believed in casting clouts wherever they'd land. Well, he had to keep his weight down somehow, so he took a smack at anything in sight, including Johnson of Curry's. Later on in Copenhagen, he went in for all in wrestling. Well, that's another story. Beep, beep. He's booked to fight at Wembley Stadium as soon as it's enlarged. And still they play deck tennis, tossing a hole entirely surrounded by rope over a hairnet. Yes, there's Joe Holland of Ulster having a go. Some of the worst tennis the world has ever seen must have been played on this trip, and those who hadn't enough strength for this he-man's game indulged in darts. Some of the, uh, the darts were, uh, were a bit erratic. I mean, there were more darts went into the North Sea than into the board. Still, doubles are very popular all over the ship. And can't those distributors distribute a pretty feather, especially the Watch Brothers? Yes, the bridge attracted several of the heads who could only see water all round. No land in sight and stocks running low. There was, in fact, considerable moaning at the bar. And here's a thirsty quartet, looking for a quart each. Well, you know where to get it, boys. Once again, the lookout party was ordered below, 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 and the ship lurched forward as several corks were drawn. Tibby Corder was hauled out of bed to give his opinion. He was severely sub-edited before being allowed to emerge from his bunk, his tie being removed so that he should choke with indignation or indigestion. Here we have another glimpse of the stars, in case you missed the first one. No, I can't come down, it's too late. Oh, here's a sad sight. Ted Baker thrown out of a milk bar before he had time to say Horlicks and a shake to you. Yes, it must have been a black and white bar, although he swears he saw several spotty cows dancing the rumba. Now, this is where the dirty work starts. Watch carefully, folks. Carl, being barred from the uh, milkery, took to the bottle, this being his annual alcohol holiday. <laughs> now then, careful, Carl, careful. He's now going to do the Perivale polka. Now watch the sinister business. Here's where Norman fills it for him. And then he took a nip from Nippy. You can just see it above the binnacle there. Nipped in the bud is the title of this pants-rending study, which apparently upset Carl's grid bias. Well, the swimming pool attracted all our little ducks and a few old geese as well. There being exactly four feet of water at the deep end, the diving was excellent, and aquatic sports were indulged in to such an extent that most of our party became daily dippers. Several of our distributors hoisted their sails and swaff, swaffed that chap on the pole. But the celebrated adder proved to be a snake in the grass, or on the pole as it is. He showed rare form in the water, magnificent form. Nothing can put him off his stroke. In fact, no factor was lacking. But so much water was swallowed that on the second day out, the pool was entirely empty. Needless to say, this was the only water swallowed on the trip. I don't know who that ball that did old bath is, but anyway, he's a good swimmer. Now here we see a thrilling pillow fight between Admiral Keyes and an opponent, but the winner was disqualified after they found the anchor in his pillow slip. Denmark was not yet in sight despite the activities of the lookout parties, who gazed out to sea and sniffed the air to find if any tubog was being wafted their way. Maps were consulted, and according to the expert map readers, the Rampura was now nearing the South Pole with the Isle of Man on the starboard beam. Others, including Doug Meldrum, are asleep on the deep by this time, and they didn't care if they were near Copenhagen or Cleethorpes. What a pretty sight, what a pretty sight. Well, at last on Friday morning, land was in sight, and what a sight it was. Little did Copenhagen know what was in store, or else they might have closed the port. Still, Copenhagen can cope with anything, even the Philco gang, and a warm reception was assured. All right, boys, don't get excited, you'll soon be there. 